so Dr. Heather Browning will be presenting uh, a talk on what is wild animal welfare. Uh, Dr. Browning is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Southampton, specializing in animal welfare, ethics, and consciousness, and she has previously worked as a researcher in animal sentience and welfare at the London School of Economics as a part of the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. Uh, Dr. Browning has several publications on measuring subjective experiences in wild animals, intelligence in welfare considerations, sentience research, and much more. So welcome, Dr. Browning. All right, thank you. Uh, just my slides. All right, so thanks everyone for coming along today. So what I'm going to be talking today is sort of very broadly, what is wild animal welfare? And so when I think about welfare, I tend to sort of think about it through this framework that has these three elements here, which is understand, measure, and improve. And so what I'm going to be doing today is talking through each of those three elements, um, which, you know, apply to welfare generally, but also I want to sort of draw a spotlight on which elements have, you know, particular implications for wild animal welfare or particular challenges for wild animal welfare. So to begin with, um, so understanding welfare. So this is something that we already heard a bit in Don's talk, but when we want to start by understanding welfare, we're asking this question of what is welfare? So essentially, you know, before you really get going on much of anything, you want to understand what you mean by welfare, because that's going to affect what kind of measures you choose and what kind of improvements you want to put in place. And people who have diverging definitions of what they mean by welfare are going to end up making different recommendations for measurement and improvement. So these two pictures here as examples, they're two spider monkey enclosures. One of them you see is quite unnatural. It's got a lot of bars and a lot of uh, logs in there, but that might be considered to be better from a point of view if you consider welfare to be mostly about the feelings of the animal because it's got a lot of activities. On the other side, you've got an island enclosure, which is very green, very natural looking, but because it's quite flat with just some straight trees, it actually has a lot less for the animals to do. So it might be much more um, one that you'd consider better by a natural living point of view, but maybe not one from the subjective welfare point of view. So this is just to sort of highlight this idea that taking different concepts of welfare can lead you to make very different recommendations about what is good or bad for welfare. So the welfare concepts, um, you know, thinking about welfare, you've got all these different ways of conceptualizing it. And usually people think about it as encompassing a range of different things. So here are some of the more common ones, subjective experiencing, physical functioning, natural living preferences, and often some sort of cluster or overlap of these is considered to be a good way of describing welfare. But I think, you know, and as Cam already pointed out in his sort of introduction, the subjective experiencing part of it is something that we're particularly concerned with. So this is the mental states and the feelings of animals. So we're really having this focus on trying to make sure that animals don't feel bad when we're thinking about their welfare. And while, you know, their physical functioning and, you know, all these other sort of, you know, their, their natural behaviors, all these things are going to feed into that. We might think that, you know, the subjective experiencing is the thing that matters to us, particularly morally. And this ties to a concept that Don talked quite a lot about, so I'm not going to go through it in much detail. But this is animal sentience, where we're thinking about, you know, the way that animals feel. So it's not a focus here on what they think, their cognitive capacities, but just this capacity for having different feelings, these positively and negative valence feelings that we capture by terms like hunger and pain, thirst, curiosity, and comfort. And this matters morally. So um, here's quite a famous quote from philosopher Jeremy Bentham where he's talking about how we decide you know, where we sort of expand our moral circle to, which beings should count for us morally. And he says, you know, what is it that should trace that insuperable line? The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And so here it's just highlighting this idea that it's not the cognitive capacities of an animal that matter when we're thinking about whether or not we should count their interests, but this capacity for suffering, which is what we take to be sentience. And so if we think of sentience as having this capacity for felt experience and welfare being, you know, related to the quality of that felt experience, then we think that sentient animals are welfare subjects. And so we get this tight link between sentience research and welfare science. How can we assess sentience? Again, I think Don talked a lot about some of the really good methods we have for thinking about the methods of investigating animal sentience. Of course, we can't look directly into the minds of animals 
but we can build an evidential picture from a range of different markers. So there's a whole lot of different ways that we've got of investigating the minds of animals, even if we can't do so directly, you know, with certain background assumptions about the evolution of um, animal mental states and about the functional role they play for animals, I think we can make quite reasonable inferences about what animals are thinking and feeling. So when you're thinking about, you know, trying to decide when an animal is sentient, we use multiple lines of evidence. So we don't just pick one criteria and say that's enough. You think, do they meet a lot of different things? And usually you want to think about their cognition, their behavior, and their physiology. So not just any one of these things, but the combination, the sort of picture that all of these things build together. And you can come up with these markers either by thinking about the evolutionary theory and the function of sentience, or also analogy with humans. So, you know, what things can humans do or not do when they're conscious of certain stimuli, or what kind of physiological systems and brain anatomy function when they are conscious as well. So here are some of the criteria for assessing sentience. This just comes from a report that I worked on a couple of years ago that was looking at assessing the evidence for sentience in cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans um, for their inclusion in new UK animal sentience law. And that was thinking about, you know, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but it's a range of criteria, some of which are to do with their anatomy and physiology, and some of which are to do with their behavioral capacities. And the idea is, you know, the more of these markers they meet, the more likely we can say the animal is a sentient one. So in terms of thinking about which animals are sentient, um, I think the consensus roughly now includes all of the vertebrates, including the fishes, even though they are the source of sun controversy. I think that's just still a few holdouts at the margins rather than dominant view. And then more recently, cephalopods and decapods based on the evidence. And then there's other groups of animals that, you know, plausibly sentient candidates, but which we just lack evidence, say insects, spiders, gastropod mollusks, worms. I think we've got absolutely no idea at the moment. There's not really much evidence one way or the other for those sort of things. But this just indicates the need to go out and investigate more so that we can figure out which are the sentient animals. And if we're thinking about the context here of wild animal welfare, it matters because you want to make sure that the species that you're focusing on are the ones that have this capacity for suffering. I think thinking about the dimensions of sentience is also really useful. So it's not just there whether an animal is sentient or not, but what are the features and varieties of its experience? So really thinking about what is it like to be that animal? You know, what from the inside, what are its needs, what are its sources of pleasure, its sources of suffering? And I think this is important because different types of animals and different species are going to have different sets of feelings and they're going to experience those to differing degrees. So, I mean, these are just hypothetical examples, but you might think, say, a caterpillar, say it might only feel hunger and thirst sensations and very little else. And so when you're thinking about what, what to do, you know, to improve the welfare of a caterpillar, you might only be thinking along those particular dimensions. Uh, for crocodiles, so, you know, these are animals that are ectotherms. They take their body energy, their body temperature regulated by the external environment. And what that means for them as compared to us, where we have to regulate the operating temperature of our body through essentially consuming food, which means that hunger is likely to be very, very important for us. They do it from their environment, which means thermal comfort is going to play a much larger role in their experience and hunger might play a much smaller role. And so when you're thinking about what's good or bad for a reptile, you might not be thinking so much about how much food it gets, but you might want to focus a lot on what kind of temperature it has. I've got a picture of a wombat here. Um, this is just because of something that comes up in the zoo industry from time to time, this sort of, you know, folk wisdom that's almost certainly false, but people say that wombats like to see the sunrise and the sunset. And so, you know, you put a large rock in their enclosure so they can get up high and enjoy the sunrise and sunset. I mean, what's going on is almost certainly something more like they just like to be able to scan the horizon. But, you know, it's possible that some animals do have these capacity for aesthetic pleasures in these kinds of ways, and that's something we might also want to take into account. So the idea is that you're thinking, you know, what kind of animal is this? What experience does it have of the world? And then we can take this into account when we're thinking about animal welfare. So when you sort of really think about what the world is like for this particular type of animal, it can help you making decisions about what's good or bad for them, and therefore what you should be doing for them. So that was sort of just a quick run through, you know, the important considerations, I guess, when you're thinking about understanding welfare. Now, the next step is the measurement step or assessment of welfare. And this is just really important because if we want to know how well an animal is doing or if there's something we should be changing, we need to measure their welfare. 
And so, you know, this is very true in captive conditions because we are in control of everything an animal receives. So we really want to make sure that the things it's getting are the things it needs, but also for wild animals as well. There's a range of questions. You know, Cam showed some of them earlier. Questions about, you know, how good the lives of wild animals are, whether there are certain impacts in their environments that are making them better or worse off. And so we need to be able to measure their welfare to make these kinds of judgments. You know, if we want to make the right decisions about what to do, we need to know what the welfare of those animals are like under different conditions. So under the current conditions versus interventions that we might do or other kinds of impacts that humans might have. And the reason this is important, this measurement, is because our intuitions about what's good for welfare can be wrong. So we've got these two pictures here, some, you know, sheep being sheared, being restrained by humans versus being restrained in a machine. And a lot of people intuitively look at this and think, well, that poor sheep in the machine, like that's obviously much worse for it. But, you know, when investigating this using welfare science, it suggests actually the machine is a better experience for the sheep than the human restraint is. And the reason for this is plausibly something like being restrained by a human is closer to being captured by a predator than a machine is. And so the animal actually feels more of a fear response in that state. And so this is just suggesting that what we as humans think might be better or worse isn't always going to easily track what is actually better or worse from the point of view of the animal. And that's why it's so important to get out there and actually use measurement. Now, in the wild animal case, I think this is definitely really salient. Um, so I think the intuitions about what wild animal welfare is like diverge really pretty strongly. So, you know, you've got the whole spectrum. So you've got this Garden of Eden. So I think maybe a lot of unreflective views on the street are that animals in nature have really, really good lives. You know, this can be seen when you look at people's opposition to zoos, for instance, where they think that, you know, it's terrible to keep an animal in a zoo because then it's not free to live its wonderful wildlife. Um, and then you have this sort of opposite view where people really, really focus on the terrible aspects of being out in the wild, I mean, this sort of, you know, nature, red in tooth and claw, and all the awful things that can be happening to animals, such that you get quite a large contingent of people who suggest that the lives of wild animals are actually overall ne negative and not at all like this Garden of Eden. And so in some of my work, I've sort of looked at this discussion and maybe tried to push it away from the extreme of the suffering view, not quite back into the Garden of Eden view, but certainly when they people have these sort of, you know, intuition-based discussions about wild animal welfare, there's this focus on sources of suffering. So thinking about the suffering that animals experience during their deaths and the suffering they experience during their lives. And I wanted to say that I think both of these might be less severe than people often assume. So thinking about bad deaths, it's pretty obvious when you think of a lot of animals in the wild that their deaths aren't great. A lot of them get eaten by large predators or they die of diseases or starvation, other things that don't seem nice. And you think that, yeah, look, being consumed by a shark, ripped apart, bleeding to death, doesn't really seem ideal. Some of the reasons to maybe push back on this being as bad as it seems. Firstly, most of these deaths just aren't prolonged. So, you know, being eaten by a predator, even at its absolute worst, tends to be at the scale of maybe 10 to 15 minutes um, before the animal loses consciousness or dies. Um, so the animals are killed quickly. Many of them are much, much quicker than that. Many predators, you know, dispatch their prey as quickly as possible, in large part because it means the predator themselves is at less risk of being injured by a struggling prey animal. And even when it's not, you know, an instantaneous or very short, relative to the length of life of that animal, it's usually still going to be a very, very small proportion of that animal's life that is spent in this state of suffering. And you sort of get this trade-off where deaths that might take a longer duration, such as some kinds of illness, are typically then going to have a lower intensity. They're not going to be spending weeks at the maximum of their pain threshold as they might in the final minutes of being eaten by a predator, for instance. So you've got this sort of trade-off of intensity and duration where, you know, not denying that the end of life isn't good, but perhaps it's not quite as bad. And another reason for thinking this is considering shock-induced analgesia. So from a lot of reports for humans who've been through you know, physical traumas, they'll report that the onset of pain occurred mostly after the event. And if you think about this from an evolutionary point of view and think, well, the function of pain is to trigger avoidance behavior and you know, allow recovery for the animal, doesn't really make a lot of sense for an animal that's about to die. And often that pain, because when you're experiencing pain, you know, you don't want to walk on an injured limb, you want to guard it, you want to stop doing anything, that can interfere with defense and escape. So the idea is here that in the moments 
you know, the first moments of being attacked and killed, there may actually be very little pain at all. And certainly a lot of humans do report this kind of experience. And tests in the lab do seem to suggest the same thing can happen for animals as well. So that fear and stress can inhibit the pain response essentially through production of endogenous analgesics. So painkillers that are produced inside the brain of the animal that make it feel less pain in those moments. Um, seeing having rats that have been exposed to cats, for instance, as a predator that was sort of off to the side, not able to actually get their rat, but that they were able to feel the fear about showed that those rats experienced less pain and did have these sort of analgesic effects. So the idea is that animals at the end of their lives might actually just be prevented from feeling the worst of the pain. So the question here about how bad a deaths are, we need to understand the intensity and duration of different modes of dying. In many cases, it's very unlikely to be the deciding factor on lifetime welfare because there's just so many other things an animal experiences across its life. And I think this comes from a sort of a salience bias. So we think about extreme events and they seem really important in our mind because they're so bad, they stick with us. But, you know, there's so many other things that add up. I mean, there's additional questions regarding how bad it is for an animal to have a premature death versus a continued life. But in terms of the actual suffering of that death, perhaps it's not so bad. And this is just an illustration here, again, of this divergence of intuitions that needs data to back it up. And same when we're thinking about the quality of lives for wild animals. So undoubtedly, they face many negative experiences. They get caught by predators. They die of dehydration and droughts. They face bushfires. All these kinds of things are going to lead to at least some suffering. But again, perhaps the negative experiences aren't quite as bad as people sort of put the emphasis on. So discussions of fear, for instance, people often think about this sort of landscape of fear concepts where the idea is that prey animals that live around predators must feel constant fear. You can see that in their behavior and in their physiology, there's a fear ecology compared to animals in predator-free environments. But it's also unclear how much this behavior and physiology is associated with an actual feeling of fear, that really negative valence feeling of fear versus just sort of, you know, a low key avoidance. Like, you know, there might be predators around, you're going to stick to the trees. doesn't mean you're actually feeling really bad most of the time. And thinking about coping strategies, the fact that stress responses are typically not very good for organisms because prolonged, um, say, high levels of cortisol, for instance, are bad for your immune system. They're bad for your cellular growth and repair. So it's a decent chance that animals have evolved to not feel this stress all the time. And what's really needed here, again, is to do some actual research to establish a link to the felt experience and not just the physiological responses. And also when we're thinking about lives, it's important not just to count all the bad experiences and sort of use those as proof if you're not going to count the good experiences as well. So animals in the wild can experience many positive things. You know, this one picture, sort of blurry one, is of a, a bird sliding down a roof of snow. So it essentially uses, I think it's a bottle cap and sits on it slides down the roof, then goes back up and does it again. So it's, you know, a play behavior. Animals have social interactions. They have parental relationships. All these things can be sources of positive experience. And it makes sense when you think that, you know, these feelings have evolved to play a motivational and decision-making role where negative feelings are going to promote avoiding some things and then positive feelings reward the useful things. So when you think about animals who experience something negative in their life, often then that's offset by a counterbalancing positive experience. So you might be hungry, but then you get the joys of eating. You might feel cold, but it feels really pleasurable to then warm up after you felt cold. And so it might turn out that sort of the calculus of these things isn't balanced towards the negative, or at least not so severely as people might assume. And you can think there might be additional positive experiences. So um, there's some evidence that birds find singing intrinsically pleasurable, for instance. Um, and this sort of concept that's come up in a few places that I really like is the idea of the joy of living, which is the idea that there might be a baseline positive affect just to existence. And you know, maybe this just motivates continuing existence, or it might be more a positive affect associated with exploration and investigation. So, you know, seeing things and learning about the world. So Pankset calls this the seeking system as one of the core affects that animals can experience. But if it's true that, you know, if everything else is taken care of, the baseline feeling of existing is mildly positive, that might also be a reason to think that the balance doesn't have to skew so negative. So, I mean, what's really important with all of this is 
this sort of emphasis on the idea that we need to compare the relative intensities and durations of positive and negative experiences. It's not enough to just list a whole bunch of things and say, well, look, here's some bad things, here's some good things. You know, it's not obvious in advance the balance will be negative. It's not obvious that's going to be positive either. And that's why measurement matters. You know, we can have two people sit next to each other and say, oh, I think feeling pain is way worse than 10 days of feeling pleasure or whatever. But without measurement, all we're doing is just training intuitions on this. So, you know, we know that wild animals have a range of experiences. We know that these are positive and negative. What we need to know is what the types of experience are and what the durations and intensities of these experiences are. How long is it in pain? How severe is that pain? How much joy do they get out of certain kinds of social interactions? And also how the animal weights these experiences. So, you know, how much fear is it willing to undergo to obtain a certain amount of eating pleasure, for instance? Yeah, so we can get an idea of the different experiences they have and how to weigh those up against each other to get something like a, a picture of lifetime welfare. So like this little diagram here shows you've got all these negatives and positives and you can add them together in some way to get an overall lifetime sort of score, but we just don't have enough information at the moment to calculate these things. So it's really important then to be doing measurement of wild animal welfare or animal welfare in general, but because we really want to know. And for wild animals, particularly even compared to compactive animals, I think we've got even more of this situation of cluelessness and we really want to get out there and start finding things out. And so where do we turn? Animal welfare science, which is used almost exclusively for captive animals at the moment, but I mean, organizations like the Wild Animal Initiative are working hard to try and get some of this put out into the wild animal sphere. So we've got animal welfare science that uses a range of different indicators to measure the welfare of an animal and to look at how this welfare changes under different conditions. So, you know, which measures we use depend, as I was saying earlier, on our definition of welfare. You know, if we think it's biological functioning, you might look at different things than if you think you're caring more about feelings. But it's important, at least, to think about what it is you're trying to measure and have that definition set out before you start choosing your indicators. So this range of welfare indicators are essentially just any methods that are used by scientists to try and gain information about the welfare state of an animal. And so these include physiological measures and behavioral measures as well. So you might look at changes in heart rate, you might look at changes in blood cortisol, you might look at the presence of stereotypic behavior, you might look at preference tests to see whether an animal you know, prefers one situation over another or how strongly it desires to have that thing. And this whole range of different indicators can all tell us something about the welfare of an animal. Um, now, we can classify these indicators as well. So we can think about them as answering different questions about animal welfare. So we've got um, whole animal measures, we've got partial measures, and measurement frameworks as well. So whole animal measures, these are measures where you can take some single indicator and use this to learn something about the entire state of welfare of the animal. So you're learning about, you know, what is this animal's welfare like at this time? You know, that's really the question you're answering with a whole animal measure. You know, if you were to say numerically, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how well is this animal doing right now at the moment that I'm sampling it? And so there's a range of different measures here. I'm not going to go through these in any detail. I think the next workshop will probably do a bit more of that. But there are these sort of different ways that have been proposed, at least, that seem to be judging what the integrated state of welfare is for the animal. So, you know, after it's had all these different experiences we're talking about and it's brought all those together into a single welfare state, what are the outputs of that state that we can measure? And so the benefits of using whole animal measures is they're comprehensive. They tell us exactly, you know, if they are really a whole animal measure, they tell us exactly how that animal is feeling at that time, including every single thing that's influencing its welfare state. It's not missing anything out. The drawback is it doesn't give us any guidance on what to improve. So these are animal-based measures. We can look at the animal and we can say, yes, this animal has a score of, you know, four out of 10 on its welfare um, scale, but we have no idea why. It doesn't tell us anything about what environmental conditions are improving or decreasing its welfare. And it doesn't tell us which particular feelings are going into creating that either. Is its welfare low because it's feeling pain or because it's feeling fear? Not very clear from these kinds of measures. So, in contrast to the whole animal measures, we have partial measures, and these are much more common. And so most of the welfare indicators we see are partial measures of some kind. And so these are single measures that will provide information on some aspect of welfare. So 
some of the animal-based indicators, which will often tell us about which specific affects the animal is experiencing. So for instance, a lot of indicators, particularly physiological ones, indicate whether the animal is stressed. So we might think that the particular affects that are associated with stress are going to be represented there, but the pleasure-based ones won't be. Um, or they might be markers of certain kinds of illness or injury. And then we also have environmental indicators, which are sort of the imports, the upstream causes of changes in welfare. So these are the conditions that influence an animal's welfare, such as how much shelter it has. This little Tasmanian devil here is in his log. You know, whether that animal has shelter, whether it has the right kind of food, whether it has the right kind of social companions. And so these conditions for welfare can be used as indicators because you could make inferences from an animal having a set of things that you think it needs for good welfare to how good or poor its welfare is going to be. Now, the benefits of using these partial measures is they can give you this more specific information about what is lacking from the welfare of an animal. The drawbacks are that they're incomplete. So it can be very difficult to tell how well an animal is doing overall just by knowing that it's feeling one particular thing or that one particular thing is missing from its environment. And so it's hard to make a judgment about the general state of welfare for that animal, but might be useful if you're just trying to make a comparison, say, between two animals, one that has and one that lacks something, if you think that everything else is hold, held fixed. Then we've got measurement frameworks. So this is a way of trying to bring together all these partial indicators to create a complete picture. So we're saying we've got these partial indicators. They each measure some little individual aspect of welfare and tell us something about how an animal's doing in one area. You can then bring these together, combine them into different measurement frameworks. So listed a few of these here. And the idea is that you get a stream of different indicators that you try to make as comprehensive as possible to pick out all the different aspects of welfare you can think of. And then you use some sort of aggregation procedure to figure out what the final welfare score is going to be based on all of these things. Now, the benefits of these is that they are comprehensive. So if you do it right and you do pick a good enough set of indicators that represent all the different aspects of welfare, you get a really comprehensive overview and it tells you exactly why the welfare is good or bad. So if an animal has a low welfare score in a measurement framework, you know the reason for that because you can look at where the scores are high or low. You can say, well, look, it's something to do with its environment or it's something to do with its health. And that way you know where to intervene. Uh, the drawbacks are, first is that they're potentially incomplete. It's very, very difficult for us as humans to sit down and think about every single thing we think matters for the welfare of an animal. And there are a lot of things that many of the common frameworks at the moment leave out. For instance, um, the exercise of agency is something that welfare scientists are taking more and more seriously, that there's a positively valianced experience associated with exercising agency. So having choice, having control over your environment. And animals will show this. They will make decisions to change things in their environment just for the sake of changing them. So if you give a monkey a light switch, for instance, it will flick that switch, regardless of whether the light was on or off to start with, just because it likes having control over whether or not the light is on and off. And so if you don't have measures of the value of agency in your framework, you might be missing something out. If you don't think about the perceptual pleasures and displeasures an animal has, you know, how bad does it feel for a dog to have a malodorous, you know, bad smells in its environment? If you don't have that in there, you might be missing something out. And so you might think you're telling someone what the welfare of that animal's like, but you're still only giving a partial picture. It can also be really hard to determine the weightings. So again, you know, you've got an animal, animal one has good health, but it's bored. Animal two is has a very interesting life, but it's sick. Which of these two animals is better off overall? How do we weight health versus boredom? Not very clear to do how to do that in the beginning. I think there are certainly ways of getting that information, but they can be quite complex. And a lot of these weightings are currently set more by sort of expert opinion, which has the possibility of being wrong. So I think overall, when we're thinking about choosing ways to measure animal welfare, yeah, there's positives and negatives to a range of different indicators. And so the idea here is that you want to select the measures that best relate to the particular goal or context you have for measurement. So whether you want to do an overall welfare assessment, you know, answering a question, how good is the life of this animal? And this is sort of thinking about these questions of wild animal welfare, you know, do they have net negative or net positive lives? What is the life of an average frog like, for instance? These overall welfare assessments will be good with one kind of indicator. Identifying areas to change, if you're really thinking about what interventions to make, might want to use other indicators. Or looking for comparisons or impacts of a specific condition. So, you know, is the frog better or worse off after we modify its environment in this way? We might only need sort of single partial indicators for these kinds of things. So it's really going to depend, and I think 
it's really important in advance to think about what the goal or context of measurement is. And then the second issue here is that the current measures have been developed primarily for captive animals. And what this means is that they need to be validated and they need to be tested for the context of wild animals. I mean, there's a huge range of different species. Most welfare indicators are species specific. The number of species held captive, at least outside of zoos, is relatively small. The number of species in the wild is absolutely immense. So I think there's this huge need right now for validating and testing indicators to take out to the wild context. And there is now some research going out into wild animal welfare, but it's still very rare. So often where someone has studied welfare in the wild in some sense, what they've really been doing is studying something else and they've just measured something like the stress or the body condition of that animal just to see whether or not the thing they're doing has a negative effect on the animal, for instance. But they're not really thinking about the affective state of the animal, the feelings of that animal, and they haven't tied the indicators to that. And very few of these studies are setting out to investigate welfare for its own sake. So I've highlighted here a series of papers. These were all done by the same team across Australia and New Zealand, um, looking at the welfare of wild horses and looking at applying particularly the five domains model, which is a one of these me measurement frameworks I was talking about that tries to look at a range of influences on welfare and bring them together to an overall assessment of welfare. And it's a really nice model about you know how people are thinking about making different indicators feasible in the wild context and using them in a different setting. But like I said, it's still very rare. So there is this additional challenge when we're thinking about measuring the welfare of wild animals, the challenge of feasibility. So you, know, you have a lot of control over captive animals. You can capture them, you can restrain them, you can change their environment, you can observe them over long periods of time, you can set up all kinds of equipment in a lab, and you can't do these things in a wild context. So, you know, you need equipment that's easy to access in the field that's portable. You often need ongoing or repeated access to the animals if you want to see, you know, is this animal better or worse off after something or how does its welfare change over time? If you're seeing different individuals, it's going to be very much harder to make these kind of inferences. And some of the methods that I describe um, even need prior training of the animals, which is essentially impossible to do in a wild context. So the indicators that might be best for a captive situation may not be the same things that are best for a wild situation. And so again, to emphasize, you know, what we really need is further investigation of which methods work best in the wild context. And I'm currently involved in a project with several members of the team, Wild Animal Initiative and some other scientists interested in this area, where we're trying to do something like this. We're trying to look at the indicators that are currently available and figure out, you know, from our current state of knowledge, which are the best ones or the most promising ones to take out and use in this wild context. But what's really needed is a lot more testing to check whether or not this is working out. Um, an additional problem that can come up is the problem of welfare comparisons. So like I said, there's just an absolutely immense number of species of animal in the wild. And if we want to assess and prioritize different actions, you know, should we be helping out frogs versus deer, we need some way of comparing this welfare across those different species. You know, we might be able to say those frogs are doing, you know, fairly well for a frog or the deer is doing fairly well for a deer. But then we might also want to think, you know, how do we compare the welfare? You know, is the most intense pain of a deer just as bad as the most intense pain of a frog? Well, here I've got cows and salmon representing the same problem in the sort of farmed context. You know, are they the same or do they have these different welfare ranges where you can see, you know, sort of the best and the worst states are just better and worse for a cow than they are for a fish, for instance, perhaps. So, you know, the problem here is that different species might have different scales of welfare and we don't have a good way of converting the welfare units between the individuals. So, you know, there's different scales here. There's, you know, length measurements in centimetres and inches. We can compare those because we know the conversion formulas. We can convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. We don't have a conversion formula for converting lions to lungfish. And so there is this additional question about how do we figure out how to convert units of welfare if we want to start making decisions across different species. So I've sort of made the case that you, know, you want to start out by understanding what you mean by welfare. You want to then get out and measure welfare so you can overcome the intuitions and actually get some real data and some of the challenges that are associated with that. And so I'm going to finish up just talking a little bit about the last bit, which is about improving the lives of animals. So I mentioned before that we can think about welfare conditions as indicators. But here we're thinking about them in terms of what we want to improve. 
So particularly when you're thinking about captive animals, you can think about all the conditions of their lives as being things that affect their welfare, that makes their lives go better or worse, the things you can provide for them. And these can include sort of physical and psychological conditions. So you might think, you know, presence of certain kinds of food, uh, presence of shelter against poor weather, companionship, social bonds, behavioural opportunities, all of these things are conditions for good welfare. Um, so the five domains that I mentioned briefly thinks about this too. It's thinking about, you know, all these range of different conditions that an animal can undergo that might impact its welfare and classifying them into these different domains just as a way of making it easier to frame and think about. So if you're wanting to think about how do we improve the welfare of an animal, part of what you want to think about is what is the entire range of conditions that can impact on its welfare? You know, what are its needs across all these different domains? These include you know, nutrition, the environment, its health, uh, behavioral interactions with other animals, with um, the environment, you know, the exercise of agency and stuff comes in here, and how all of these things impact the way they feel. It allows you to start thinking about a huge range of conditions that can impact on an animal's welfare and therefore start thinking about what sorts of things to intervene or change. So what's really important here is thinking about the species-specific needs and interests. So, you know, different species have different natural histories. And so this is sort of all within a captive setting. You, know, you often want to think about this, that, you know, alligators, water animals, they often like having water-based enrichments like fountains and waterfalls. A serval cat in the wild hunts by jumping. So raised enrichment that it has to leap for can be good for it. Um, cockatoos really like to manipulate things with their beak and they're quite clever. So tool-based enrichments could be really good for them. The idea is you need to know something about what the needs and interests are of the species as the kind of animal they are. Uh, preference testing is another way of getting at what animals need. So, I mean, preference testing allows us to set up, say, two different resources an animal has access to and see which one it chooses, but also how hard it will work to get access to a resource. So this picture here, which is a little silver fox, he has to pull a string that's on a weighted door, and if he pulls it a certain amount of times, the door will open. He pulls it some amount of times to get to his friends, so he values it that much. He pulls it much more times to get to the food, so he values the food more. And this could be a really nice way of figuring out what animals want and potentially applicable to wild animals as well. Um, it may be difficult to sort of conduct these tests in the field for wild animals, but certainly wild species that are held in captivity, you can start getting an idea of what matters to them by seeing what sort of what they like and what they'll work for, what they prefer, and then make inferences about what is good or bad in the wild based on those preferences. So for captive animals, when we want to find what the best conditions for welfare are, you'll usually think about their natural history as a base, then use experimental methods like preference tests and these welfare measurements under different conditions. So, you know, give them this type of floor versus this type of floor and see whether they do better or worse with them. And then use established welfare frameworks like the five freedoms or the five domains in order to get a sense of, you know, how to think about all these different conditions. For wild animals, I think we can use some of these methods. So we're going to be able to use some of the same frameworks, but we're limited in our species knowledge. So again, big range of species, many that we don't know anything about, especially a lot of the smaller and more cryptic species, and our access for testing them is a lot worse. So I guess we're operating under these additional constraints and that you can do the best you can with these kinds of methods, but it may not go as far. And then there's also this additional question that comes up with thinking about, you know, the conditions for welfare for wild animals. And this is the question of welfare biology. So this is about understanding which features of the biology of a species, like its ecology or its life history strategy, are correlated with trends in species welfare in the wild. So, you know, one very common kind of grouping that comes up in discussions of wild animal welfare are the R-selected versus the K-selected species. Um, so Cam talked a little about this before, our selected species have a life history strategy where they give birth to a lot of offspring, most of them die young, um, whereas K-selected species will invest a lot in a very small number of offspring and try and bring them through to adulthood. Oh, thanks, Anne. So yeah, the issue that's coming up here is that, you know, people hypothesize that our selected species will on average have worse welfare because, you know, there's more of them and resource constraints and they die young. That may or may not be true, but that's certainly a testable hypothesis. It's something you can go out and look at. And if you can find a trend like that, you can then use that to make inferences about other species. So there's some really interesting interactions here between welfare science and ecology for figuring out what life history traits might correlate 
with welfare. Um, predator and prey might be another example. You might think that on average, prey animals have worse welfare than predator animals just because they get chased more often. So they have more experiences of fear and anxiety and pain. Again, testable hypotheses, but thinking a lot about, you know, what are this sort of the ecology and the life history of different species and how does that lead to general patterns in welfare is something that we can think about for wild animals that is a different sort of application than for captive animals. And then finally, once we've sort of thought about all these different things, we can actually start assessing the actions that we have for making change in animal lives. So you could examine current or proposed actions and practices, so things that, you know, we currently do or things that we're going to change, and look at, you know, how these are impacting the interests of wild animals. So if you're building new things, for instance, you know, how is that going to impact the wild animals around? How is this road going to affect the wild animals in the area? How is, you know, building a new suburb going to change things? Um, here, the example I've got is disease transmission. So right now we've got quite a horrific problem where the avian flu, which is incubated and transmitted within high density poultry farms, has escaped to the wild and is wreaking absolute havoc on populations of wild birds in many parts of the world. And so, you know, here's a place where we can think about how assessing how human actions have an impact on wild animals can be more indirect than you'd imagine. But then this could lead to policy recommendations for protection of wild animals and interventions as well. So direct interventions to prevent sources of suffering. So the questions of when should we act are tricky ones. So these are more there's some of them empirical questions, but some of them are also more philosophical questions. So I think there are three potential barriers to action when we're thinking about wild animal welfare. The first one is a question of welfare levels. So how do we decide when welfare is bad enough to intervene? So you might just do this comparatively and say, well, look, we're just going to find the worst welfare that's feasible to do something about. We'll intervene there. Or you might want to say something like, look, we intervene when welfare gets below a certain level, say a life worth living, you know, which animals don't have a life worth living. And then there are a lot of questions around how we decide what those thresholds are. There's also a big feasibility question. So actions to improve the lives of animals can have complex webs of unforeseen consequences. Ecology is really, really difficult. Ecosystems are insanely complex. And so it's very, very difficult to figure out in advance what effect your actions are going to have. And this is something that we've seen people hit time and again, introducing new species into ecosystems to try and solve one problem creating an even worse problem somewhere else. So there's this sort of epistemic challenge. And then there's the idea of perhaps ethical and social support. So, you know, some people might think that our relationships with wild animals are different. I think that's things. Um, yeah, that we don't have the kinds of relationships with wild animals that give us duties to intervene on their behalf. And so there are different ethical frameworks for thinking about how we interact with animals, some of which will be quite sympathetic towards helping wild animals and some will not. And also just the general social support, you know, do members of the public, do politicians think that these are important issues and, you know, how do we sway these decisions or change minds or should we act alongside with them? So to finish up for the big question of what is wild animal welfare, I think, you know, there's a couple of things you want to think about sort of that are specific to wild animal welfare. So the first is the types of questions we want to answer. So, you know, when you're thinking about wild animal welfare, what is that you're trying to figure out? You know, is it just the baseline quality of life of different species? That's one kind of question. The effects of certain kinds of interventions, another big question. And what I was saying before with welfare biology, this sort of idea of ecological patterns in welfare, also very interesting. And these are all questions that are sort of different from the captive animal case. And there are also sets of unique measurement challenges. So we've got issues of feasibility in the wild. You know, what can we actually do when we get out there in the field? Um, the interactions with ecology and natural history that might change the way we do our measurements and how we make interspecies comparisons. And then we can think about the challenges in intervention as well. So we have much less control over the conditions of wild animals. So it's quite easy in a zoo to just make a decision that we're no longer going to give this animal, you know, this kind of temperature or this kind of shelter. Can't do that in the wild. There's the complexity of the conditions and the unknown effects of our interventions. There's the problems of determining what the welfare baselines are that we think we should act on and also the social and ethical imperative to act. So to conclude, I think thinking about animal welfare in any context involves three elements, but we can also apply this to wild animal welfare. So we want to understand what welfare is. We want to measure the welfare of our animals. And so for the wild animal context, that involves identifying the best methods that will work in the wild 
and answering questions about the quality of life for different types of wild animals. And then we want to improve welfare wherever we see an opportunity to do so, which requires understanding of causes and effects of welfare and requires sufficient public support. So to sort of wrap up, I guess, you know, the big takeaway message here is that the study of wild animal welfare has unique questions and unique challenges beyond that of captive animal welfare that requires um, sort of new approaches or at least new spins on the existing approaches. But I think we've got the tools to get there. It's just a matter of putting in the time and work to start getting answers to some of these questions. All right. Thank you.